Welcome back to week two of Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. This is the third lecture of this week. Now, if you remember, in the first lecture, we introduced this time sampling method, this idea that you know, the probabilities are driven by this Boltzmann Law, but that's in this two to the n space, and a very practical way of calculating these distributions is to use the time sampling method, which operates in the n space. <clears throat> now in the second lecture, we showed how these parameters, the x and the w, which are in n space, they control the response in this 2 to the n space. So for example, I think we took these two examples with just four of these neurons that is n is equal to 4, and so x was a four component column vector, and the weight matrix was 4 by 4, and what we showed was with a few combinations how if you look at the response in state space, which is 2 to the power 4, so there are like 16 components, and you can have peaks at different places in that 2 to the n space depending on what you choose. So what we want to do going forwards, like in this lecture, is <clears throat> then how to choose your x and w so that it actually does something useful for you. In the sense, in this case, yes, you can see that the response is changing in 2 to the n space, but what use is it? Well, what you want to do is choose x and w so you actually get some useful results, like it actually solves the problem you're interested in. So that's what we'll be doing in this lecture. Now, the problem we'll consider as an example, but this is really an example of a very broad class of problems that you could call optimization, or I guess what you might call constrained optimization. So that's what I'll try to illustrate using this problem, which is we we'll call this graph partitioning. Like, let's say there are six nodes, and one, two, and three, one, two, and five have some connections between them. The connections are bidirectional in the sense it's like the pair one and two have a certain connection, not like it's directed from one to two, right? It's bidirectional. And three, four, and six have some connection. And the problem is described by some kind of a connection matrix which where these numbers tells you the strength of the connection. So 12 is the strength of the connection from 1 to 2 and 2 to 1. 3 is the connection from 1 to 5 and 5 to 1, etc. Now the problem is, the, I guess the min cut problem would be, how do I take these six nodes and break it up into three groups so that they are as weakly connected as possible between the two groups? So the groups may have internal connections, but there is very little connection between one group and another, and we want to minimize that. And in this case, it's kind of obvious because actually the way I choose the connections, I chose the connections here, is that one, two, and five have connections, and three, four, and six have connections. So you obviously break it up as one, two, five, and three, four, six. Now the reverse problem, that's a max cut problem, that is how do you divide them so that the connections are as strongly as strong as possible. And in this case, it's not immediately obvious because it means that, well, you should take one, two, and maybe another from the other group, or <clears throat> maybe one and two more from the other group. So there's many possibilities, and it's not immediately obvious which one. And the method will describe to you, kind of allows you to solve both these problems. Now consider the first problem, the min cut problem. There, as I said, if you take these six nodes, represent it with your six neurons, and then what you want is, the solution is that one, two, and five are in one group, and three, four, and six are in another group, which means the solution should have the same symbol, zero or one, one of them, for one group and the other one for the other. So for example, here, one, two and five, those are one, and three, four, and six are zero. Or one, two,
2 and 5 could be 0, and 3, 4, and 6 could be 1. So what you'd like is the state space response to look something like this. You have two peaks at these two values. So here you'll see there's six possibility, six neurons. So in terms of configurations, there are two to the six of them, which is like 64. So I've kind of drawn this picture as eight numbers on this side and eight numbers on this side. So the way you read it is, let's say this peak, where is it? Well, it's like 0, 0, 1, that's these first three digits, and then 1, 0, 1, which is the last three digits. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, that's this peak. This one is like 1, 1, 0, and then 0, 1, 0, that's this other peak. So this is the solution you're kind of looking for. Now, the question is, how do I choose my energy function in terms of x and w so that the peaks come out this way? Because then you see, once that energy function, I have the energy function, I could simulate it using the sampling method we talked about, and I'd automatically get the peaks, and the peaks would then tell me the answer. So what I need to be able to do is, once someone tells me this connection matrix, I should be able to write down an energy function that will make these two the preferred response, which means these are, should be the low energy states. So what you want to do then is, we define a function where you have the CRQ, that's this connection matrix, times FRQ. Now what is FRQ? Well, the idea is that if R and Q both belong to the same group, which means if both are zero or if both are one, then uh, it doesn't contribute to the energy, that's zero. On the other hand, if one is zero and the other is one, that means you're kind of cutting across from one group to the other, and in that case, the FQR is one. And this way, when I add them all up, what will happen is note that the C matrix, these are all positive numbers. So this way you'll basically add up the C, the value of C for all those connections between the two separate groups. And so when I minimize the energy, it will tend to minimize all those, the, the CRQ, it will minimize it such that the C's are as small as possible between the two groups. So how do I write this? Well, you can, one way to write it is SR minus SQ square. Well, why? Because, well, you see, if the two are equal, I get zero. If the two are not equal, one is one and the other is zero, I get one. That's it. So this is it really. So once you have written this energy, the point is the energy is a minimum when uh, you have this min cut condition is satisfied. And so whatever I'll do for the next few slides is work on this a little bit algebraically so that I can come out with the X and W matrices that I need in order to do my time sampling. Okay. So first thing is I square this. So A minus B squared is A squared plus B squared minus 2AB. I then note that you see S being this binary variable 0 or 1, S square is really equal to S. So I drop the squares. So then basically E becomes CRQ times SR plus SQ minus 2 SR SQ. Okay. Now, what I want to do is take this and put it in our canonical form. You know, this form that we talked about for linear synapses. There is a term that's linear, which is what you often call the bias term. And then there's a term that's quadratic, which you call the weight term. So what I want to do is fool around with this a little bit, manipulate it so that I can put it in this form. So first thing I do is, you see, this is summation SR XR. So this first term, I write it as summation SR and then summation CRQ over Q. So you can kind of see that this thing, whatever it is, kind of contributes to the X. Similarly, the second term I could write as summation SQ times CRQ summed over R. 
And this last term, I've just written it exactly the way it is, because this you'll notice is already kind of in this form anyway. Now, one little modification is, you see, here, I've, what I'd like to do in order to compare with this is, I'd like to make this first summation instead of Q, I'd like to make it R so that it looks just like this. So what I do is here I've got this summation over Q and R, so let me just interchange them. So what is Q, I'll call it R, and what is R, I'll call it Q. So that way now, you see I, this last line looks exactly like my canonical form. It's like summation SR times something plus summation SR times something. So it's like summation SR XR, and then this one is like the weight term. So comparing the two then, if I compare these weights, I can immediately get what W is. WRQ is equal to minus four times CRQ. Why the minus four? Well, there's a half here and there's a minus two there, done. What about XR? Well, it's basically this summation and this. So XR is equal to sum over Q, CRQ plus CQR. So remember, C was the original problem we started from. That's what people gave us, their connection matrix. And we are trying to solve the min cut problem. And what we now have figured out is a, a, an expression for the energy that has exactly this form and where I can write down the x's and w's in terms of that connection matrix. And now I can just simulate this system, this system of six neurons or whatever it is. In, in this problem, we had six and then what it would do automatically is select out the lowest energy states, and those lowest energy states would be the solutions to my min cut problem. Okay. Now, if we do that, actually, so this is relatively straightforward. You could do it numerically, or actually, if you want to write out all the energies, you can. In this case, you can. You see, you don't really need to do the sampling method. Sampling method. You could just do it the Boltzmann way, which means write out the energy of all the 64 states and calculate their probabilities and see which ones are highest. Anyway, so if you do all that, you'll see that you actually get the peaks that we talked about. These were the correct solutions, if you remember, but you also get two additional solutions here. One that's all zero and the other that's all one. Why? Because you see, both of them satisfy the condition we imposed. We say that if uh, any bond, any connection that goes between a one and a zero should be as small as possible. Well, here there are all ones. So there are no bonds between one and zero. And the same here. So these kind of satisfy the condition we imposed. And so it's not surprising that these solutions also came up. So, but of course, it's not the solution we want because the original problem said, take your six neurons, six uh, nodes, and break it up into two equal groups, put three in one and three in the other. So here you have taken all six and put them in one group, and the same here. So that's not what you're looking for. So that is where we have to put in a constraint into the problem. We have to figure out a way so that whenever the number in the two groups, when the number of ones is not equal to the number of zeros, there is a large energy cost to it. Remember, in all optimization problems, there is a cost function. You see, when, what the problem does is try to minimize that cost. And of course, in these Boltzmann circuits, in these things, what is minimized is the energy. So energy is like, is the cost function. So the way you do it is, I could add a term like this to the energy. Now I already have something and I'm going to add another term. And what is this term? It says that, well, when I add up the values of all the spins, the answer should be equal to half the total number. So if I had six, the answer should be three. And then you can see that the, these ones, when I add them all up, I get three. But these ones, when I add them up, I get zero here and I get six there. So those are not acceptable. And if I add a term like this to the energy, it will discriminate against those solutions. So again, we want to get it back into this canonical form. So the way we do it is, 
Okay, expand the square. So n over 2 square, that's n square over 4. And then there's 2 times n over 2 times this summation, that's this. And then there's the summation sr squared, which is like summation sr times summation sq. And because this term I'm keeping the same way, these are, you could kind of put it together and write it this way if you like. And here, you see, it is good to separate out the terms that have r equal to q. And the reason is that you see the way the weight matrix is, usually the diagonal elements of w should be zero. So the weight matrix should not, there should not be any w r r or w q q. And so when r is equal to q, those terms are best kind of separated. So I've written one as r not equal to q s r s q, and there's a term that's just r equal to q terms, and there you get sr square. Now, as I've mentioned before, with binary variables, sr square is just like sr. And so when I combine these two things, they are both like sr, I just get a n minus 1. So at the end of the day, the energy comes out as n square over 4 minus this n minus 1 sr plus sr sq. Right? Now, Again, what you do is compare it to this canonical form. And you can see that what you're adding here is a term that's like the w is like 2 times this, I guess, whatever is here. And that's what I've written as 2 times k, because when I'm adding this term to the energy, I could give it a weight k, depending on how strongly I want to enforce that constraint. So this k is a you could choose as you like. So you could multiply this whole thing by k when adding to the other condition before. So this then adds this 2k term there. And this one then adds a term that's like minus n minus 1 and then times k. Now what about the constant? Well, you see, adding a constant to the energy that's independent of all the spins, that makes no difference really. Because in terms of probabilities, it just adds a kind of multiplies everything by the same constant. And since all probabilities eventually have to add up to one when you normalize them, it really doesn't matter. So in general, with this energy, the linear term matters, the quadratic terms matter, but any constant is irrelevant. At the end of the day, the probability will look the same whether I add this or not. And Sure enough, now if I do the simulation with inclu by including the k, what we'll find is, well, when k was zero, we had these two extra peaks, but once we put in the k, we only get the two peaks that we want. And to what extent these unwanted peaks are suppressed will depend on what k I use. So here I used a k of four. If I had used something less, like one or half, then they wouldn't be completely suppressed. They would st you'd still see some of it. Okay. So this is what you might call the min cut problem, as we discussed. So this is where you're trying to minimize the energy of cutting the two groups apart. Okay. Now, if you want to solve the max cut problem, then what you do is you just add a minus sign, because an energy that minimizes something, if you put a minus sign, then it would maximize it. Because, so let's say you have 1, so you prefer 1 relative to 10. But then if you put a minus sign, then of course you'll prefer minus 10 relative to minus 1. So you just have to add the minus 1. You don't change anything about the term that has the k in it, because that is intended to ensure that you have the same number of zeros and ones in both groups. So now if you do that, sure enough, you'll solve the max cut problem and you'll get a different set of peaks. And now in this case, the groups are 2, 3, 4 is one group and 1, 5, 6 is the other group. 2, 3, 4 and 1, 5, 6. So in other words, you, yeah, you like to keep the 2, 3 and 4 to together and 1, 5 and 6 together. And you can kind of see why if you look at the connection matrix. You see, there's a 12 that connects one and two. So you want to put one and two in, in separate groups so that when you cut it, you're cutting a 12. 
And remember, this is a max cut problem where you want to cut as much as possible. Similarly, 5 and 3, you see, you'll notice they also have a connection and the 6 and 4, right? If you look here, the 6 and 4 have a connection of like 14, I believe. And so that also appears in these two different groups. And I think the 5 and the 3 actually may not have a connection, but then you see, they probably didn't have a choice. So they maximized with respect to that by keeping the 12 and the 14 connections in two separate groups. Okay, so the bottom line then is that you see, you could solve the min cut problem or the max cut problem just by changing the sign of this second term. And the first term was mainly for imposing this constraint that you should have equal number of zeros and ones. And this is what I guess you could write out in matrix terms if you like. That is, you know, here I have WKI is equal to 2K minus plus, WRQ is equal to 2K minus plus 4CRQ. So in matrix form, you see W looks like minus plus 4C. And this 2K, of course, that's the number, a constant. And what you want is that constant everywhere on W to add everywhere on W, except of course on the diagonals, because the weight matrix never has anything on the diagonal. So that's why I've written it as 2K minus 2K times the identity matrix. That way, this quantity, when you evaluate it on the diagonals, you just get zero. And similarly, what's here, you could write in a, again in a matrix notation where this you write it as C plus C transpose times a vector that is all ones. And this multiplication effectively does this summation. So this is just a compact matrix way of writing this. Whereas here you have written it out component by component. So <clears throat> summing up then, what we're trying to show in this lecture is how you can use this, these Boltzmann circuits, these probabilistic circuits to solve optimization problems or what you might call constrained optimization. And I showed it using this example of this min cut and max cut that you have a graph. Point is how to choose, divide into two groups so that the, when you cut, you cut as many bounds as possible or as little as possible. And you could easily go from one problem to the other by changing the sign of this second term. And this first constraint imposes the, makes it, makes the two groups be of equal strength. So if you have three in the first, you also have three in the second. Okay. Now what we'll do next is, we'll talk about a, another kind of application, which you could view as a different kind of a logic gate. So thank you and see you then.